Um, okay, so this is a slightly more focused title that will make sense shortly for this presentation. Um, so just to start with, as you're all completely familiar with, is that uh, the rates of electron transfer reactions generally are described by transition state theory, aka Marcus theory, and we can think of um, tuning them by changing the driving force for the reaction or changing the solvent reorganization energy. You heard a little bit about that in the last session. For instance, in Brian's talk, where he spoke about uh, um, the role of amino acids in these redox active proteins in changing the electron transfer kinetics. And that's something that we've been studied and he already spoke on this. So I removed it from the talk in the context of these non-natural enzymes or enzymes performing non-natural uh, chemistry. And we're really interested in the electron transfer reactions there, but I'm going to talk about something a bit more fundamental and it's getting to the idea, can we go beyond this tuning um, in transition state theory and other, other, other knobs that we could play with. And so it brings to mind the idea of using order or coherence um, to enable function. So all the cells in a heart, for instance, um, if they fired stochastically, it's the basis of transition state theory, um, then the heart wouldn't be able to beat periodically. And this would be a problem, clearly. Um, but to synchronize them, we get a completely new fun um, function at the ensemble level. And so the question is, are there some ways um, that electron transfer reactions can use this coherence? So going away from the normal picture of chemistry on the right, which is stochastic theories um, based on, for instance, white noise to something where we can synchronize phase and amplitude of various degrees of freedom to change what happens. And so we've, for many years, been thinking about this in the context of electron transfer. Um, but what I'll talk about today are some recent results that specialize then to thinking about the vibrational degrees of freedom. So on the right hand side, um, you can see now that we could expand or add another dimension to um, the Marcus theory plots that I showed earlier, where in addition to the solvent coordinate um, that I showed you making up those free energy curves, we could add um, the specific intramolecular degrees of freedom, the, the vibrations of the molecules. And I'll talk a bit about when and if they can play a role in the, as a reaction coordinate. Um, and this was, of course, as no doubt you well know, um, studied in the 80s in particular by Jordner and Bixen, and they came up with predictive ways of thinking about the role of these high frequency modes. But typically, those latter of levels, what they do is change the free energy relationships for electron transfer reactions, and they can speed up the, high the involvement of high frequency vibrations in that way can speed up certain electron transfer reactions by orders of magnitude compared with predictions that you would make without the involvement of the high frequency modes. And that's work, for instance, by Gilbert Walker and Paul Barbara. Um, oops. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is, first of all, just talk about an experimental approach. What is a way that we could um, look at the involvement of high frequency modes in an electron transfer reaction. So what experiments should we do? And then I'll tell you about specific results. Actually, it's a rather surprising result where we see the electron transfer reaction itself. I'll put this into context with the experiment, with the experimental approach, but the electron transfer reaction itself generates a coherent wave packet of vibrational motion. Uh, it took us a while to understand that this is what was going on. This is rather surprising. So why we would need special experiments here is that averaging is going to hide what these high frequency modes are doing. So for instance, if we're just measuring a rate constant, we don't have enough information in that rate constant alone to say, well, this part of it is um, the Marcus theory part, let's say, the stochastic fluctuations of the environment. This part is due to the high frequency modes. 
So we need some kind of measurement strategy uh, that will enable this. And the experiments I'll show you are simply pump probe experiments, um, but with very short broadband pulses. So a pump excites a sample and we probe the change in the spectrum after that. The key to how this works though, is this, um, I can give an example. So if you were looking in a forest of fireflies, you know that they flash on and off. Um, and of course you can see the fireflies flashing in the forest. But if somebody else um, uh, couldn't walk around and watch the fireflies, but could just do an ensemble measurement that just measured the light in the forest, you know, averaging over 10 to the 17 fireflies, they would see that there's a glow in the forest, but they couldn't see the flashing because the phases are all out of sync of the fireflies. So they could never see the fact that they flash. Um, on the other hand, if we could synchronize the fireflies, which can happen in some forests, um, <clears throat> then even if we do an ensemble measurement of 10 to 17 fireflies, if, they're synchron if the flashing is synchronized, we'll see a modulation of the signal and we'll see indeed that they flash. And this is a strategy that we can take to study high frequency vibrations or any vibrations in molecular spectroscopy. And what it involves is going away from mapping out in the frequency domain, the eigenstates. So this is what we would do in, in um, for instance, high resolution spectroscopy. So rather than mapping out that ladder of states, so on the left here, I've just schematically shown the ladder of states with a short laser pulse, we excite a superposition of those states, <clears throat> which generates um, a, what's called a wave packet. And so now we've produced something that's dynamic, that looks much more um, classical, if you like, is that we can see the harmonic vibrations of the normal modes of the molecule in real time. And that's because as um, as the displacement changes periodically, the energy gap changes as shown here between ground and excited state because the potentials on each normal mode are displaced. And it's only displaced potentials that will pick up in this experiment. And on the right, you see, these would be ripples on top of the normal pump probe spectrum. Um, you see here several normal modes of the molecule contributing to these wave packets. So they're very distinct. And there's a lot we can learn from analyzing them. At the key point of this is that wave packet is at the ensemble level. So all the molecules are synchronized in their oscillation, like the fireflies in the forest. And we can study them in quite some detail. <clears throat> so then what we could imagine with our electron transfer reaction, if we start it, with the pump pulse that generates these wave packets and we could then probe the product state we could look are these wave packets in the product state are they damped going there um, etc okay so that that's the idea and that will give us some insight which took us <clears throat> um, you know a while to wrap our heads around what we should be looking for and the key message here is there's really two kinds of vibrational coherences that we would see in that product state. There's those that are along the reaction coordinate, the ones that we would be interested in. And these tend to be damped. I'll show you that briefly in a moment. And then there's many other high frequency modes, which are orthogonal to the reaction coordinate. So they don't affect the dynamics. And these are spectator modes. And these are these oscillate strongly in the product state. So they're kind of transferred from reactant to product. Of course, it's the same molecule <clears throat> oscillating. It's just become a cation or, or an anion. Um, so in early work on this, <clears throat> for instance, when we were studying, this is the betaine molecule that Paul Barbara studied. Um, and we could tease out in time what each of these vibrational normal modes were doing, or at least in windows of frequency. And we could see that um, we could identify at least a couple of these vibrational modes that were strongly damped um, on the time scale of, or faster than the time scale of the electron transfer reaction. Whereas all the other normal modes, and there's many of them were undamped. Okay, in other words, they seemed completely oblivious to the electron transfer reaction at all. So these normal modes, if you look at the table at the bottom, for instance, 
when the electron transfer was faster, there's a back electron transfer actually in acetonitrile, um, the damping of those modes were faster. And so um, that was the starting point for this. And then <clears throat> we figured, well, we studied many different systems and this was fortuitous, to be honest, this discovery of this perylene diamide molecule um, in a system that we'd studied before, which is an electron donating solvent. So you dissolve the molecule in dimethyl aniline or any similar solvent to that. And when you photo excite the molecule, the perylene diamide in this case is a very fast electron transfer from the solvent. So it's not diffusion limited. This is the reason for studying these, but it's in solution. Um, and we could, of course, carry out all the usual photophysical studies. Um, the key point of, uh, that you need to know, I guess, is on the top right here, is that there's a distinct um, excited state absorption or absorption of the anion of the perylene diamide. So after it receives the electron from the solvent, there's a new spectral signature that we can detect with our probe pulse. And that's really important because we don't want that we don't want the product signal to be overlapping with any of the signals um, from the reactant state of the system, the neutral perylene diamide. And we can study the system both in a solvent that doesn't donate the electron. So this is these data, it doesn't matter about the details of the data, but on the bottom left, you see ripples in those pump probe data, They're the vibrational wave packets that we just generate on the PDI and they're unperturbed. And the experiments we'll do are on the right that I'll tell you about is where we, uh, same excitation conditions, but now we have the fast electron transfer. And so I can quantify fast, surprisingly fast. It's about time constant is around 60 femtoseconds. Um, so this is a dilution experiment shown here that as you have um, more, more and more concentration of dimethyl aniline until it's all dimethyl aniline, um, you see the decay here of the, of the reactant is extremely fast and that's the rate of electron transfer. So this is why we were interested in this really fast electron transfer. And the oscillations, of course, are not noise. Uh, they're the vibrational wave packets that we're interested in. And so to get information about them, we Fourier transform these data so we can get a spectrum of them. Um, but firstly, you know, the explanation for that fast electron transfer, it's obviously much faster than the solvent reorganization time, which often limits the rate of electron transfer reaction. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear that the high frequency modes of the molecule of perylene diamide itself are important for the reaction coordinate here, just like was established with the betaine system by Paul Barber's group a long time ago. And that's indeed the case. So it's, it's high frequency modes that I'll show you in a moment um, that um, effectively change the free energy conditions for the driving force, because now you have a ladder of states going up here in the, in the product um, free energy curve, the pink curve here, or in this case, it's a potential, of course. Um, and so you can get energy matching of the reactant and product high up in that quantum ladder of states. And so in other words, rather than being deeply in the inverted region that you'd expect just by looking at the potentials, um, it's a barrierless electron transfer, which can be calculated. The rate can be calculated, of course, from this Jortner Vixen theory. Um, one thing that does come up though, is um, if the reaction is so fast and barrierless, is this a case where we might affect the, expect the electron transfer to be so-called coherent, um, which would mean that the reactant and product maybe appear as the superposition state initially before they dephase. <clears throat> and you would expect to see, say, recurrences back to the reactant um, in an ideal situation. Interestingly, Jortner and Bixen had already thought about this kind of situation and predicted that that wouldn't be the case because there's so many pathways when you sum over the different vibrational levels accessible um, that the phases will cancel because that sum has to happen at the amplitude level. 
and the amplitudes then cancel in the overall rate expression. And um, frustratingly, one would therefore say that it would be very, very difficult in molecular systems to get um, coherence. In fact, that's exactly what we see. Um, so despite such a fast electron transfer reaction that's happening on this intramolecular coordinate, we do not see, we don't certainly don't see recurrences. And, um, and what we see is a, is a damping of the high, this high frequency modes or the wave packets along that high frequency coordinate that's part of the, the, the reaction coordinate that I was plotting in the previous slides. So for instance, with the Fourier transform of the relevant wave packets, the reactant of the blue curve here, and you see the you see the, the quenching of these modes that are involved along the coordinate in the pink plot. Okay, they're not there, and that's just because the damping is really fast. It happens with the electron transfer reaction, and that's and that's telling interaction is incoherent, which is a, um, not entirely expected, but maybe not surprising in hindsight. Um, the surprising result was then when we looked in the low frequency side of the spectrum, um, <clears throat> where the reactant again Fourier transformed in this frequency window, 100 to 500 wave numbers is the, is the dark blue and the pink, are the wave packets, the frequencies that we see in the product state. And there's a new frequency that appears in the product state that's highlighted by that gray curve that's not in the reactant. This is a, a, a vibrational mode that is not displaced in, um, in the neutral perilin diamid system. Um, but evidently it has a displacement when you form the perilin diamid anion. And the mode, it's not obvious how to assign the mode. Actually, it's probably not just the perylene diamid anion, it's probably involves also um, the dimethyl aniline or the other solvent that we, other solvents that are similar that we've used for the same result. So um, this wave packet is produced by the electron transfer reaction and I'll explain how that happens. Um, you can, so these are just maybe to show that it, somehow it shows it more dra dramatically, these dilution experiments, where when we go um, from just um, THF solvent, of course, we don't see the wave packet is being generated. There's no electron transfer. And as we um, add in the electron donor, the dimethyl aniline, you see more and more of this photo generated wave packet, or it's actually a electron transfer generated wave packet has an unusual structure that I'll mention at the end. Um, so here's the, here's the idea is that the electron transfer, um, the 60 femtosecond part happens on the high frequency modes. Okay, because it they, they, they can respond the fastest, of course. And so and what that does is produce a non equilibrium anion of the perylin diamid diamid and um, and now it's the anion, but it's in the ground state geometry. Um, and yet along the low, low frequency mode, it needs to distort to equilibrate to the anion state. So it's a little bit like we've created a spring that's stretched. Okay, in the ground state, it was at equilibrium. At that same geometry, now it's a stretched spring in the excited state. And if you now let it go, it will start to oscillate spontaneously. And with the separation of time scale between the fast initial electron transfer reaction and then the much slower time scale of that low frequency mode just from its period, um, that's why you get the stretching release and then the, the oscillations along the low frequency mode. So there's two coordinates involving the intramolecular degrees of freedom, the high frequency coordinate that puts you in a non-equilibrium anion and then after that, you get the final relaxation on the low frequency coordinate and then the solvent, of course. Um, so I can sum this um, up, this series of events that are going on here. And that's, I think, the, the main result here is that we're able to see a sequence of events in the electron transfer reaction. And each one, of course, um, ratchet, ratchets the system away from the initial state. So it, it blocks 
recurrences, coherence, and so on in a in a hierarchy of time scales. So the initial um, reaction happens on the high frequency modes. So that makes this deeply in what would be a deeply inverted region reaction really fast. That produces um, the non-equilibrium anion. And then, now how did I do this? Oh yeah, okay. And then on the right hand side there, you see then the next phase of this is that now we can relax on the low frequency intramolecular coordinate. And after that, it's the solvent relaxation. And so we could model this with Redfield theory with the um, vibrational modes treated quantum mechanically. And you can see some snapshots here of the overall um, potential energy surface for these two modes, the high frequency mode, the low frequency mode. The X is the, um, the equilibrium in the excited state of the reactant and the X, the red X over here is that of the product. And here's the Frank Condon region that we photo excite to so the initial motion. Actually, I can't see it on my screen, but it's the movement of the wave packet on the high frequency coordinate. And that crosses the barrier and puts um, density on that product state, which after that, and it's quite separate time scale relaxes um, going upwards on the y axis on that low frequency coordinate. You can see in the simulations, there's a small amount of recurrence here, which we can't pick up in the experiment. Um, but the simulation is completely consistent with the experiment. It's interesting, the separation of time scales. Um, so um, the one interesting point here that you may have noticed, and it's an open question, I can tell you a way to think about it, is this structure that we see in the wave packet generated by the electron transfer reaction. So you see, rather than the, just a single mode at, at 313 wave numbers, it's like a little progression. And this can be modeled with anhomogeneity in that vibration, um, which is fine. Um, exactly how to understand in the context of the wave packet, how you get that structure though, um, with the, um, the, um, the number of quanta in the system, how you form that wave packet, I think is still an open question. Interestingly, exactly the same structure was predicted 30 years ago by John Jean and Graham, Graham Fleming um, in, a, in a Redfield theory calculation, complete just prediction of a reaction that was in that paper enabled us to understand actually what we were seeing in, in this particular work. But this is an open question here. What um, produces that structure and what can we learn from it? And we have done some work along those lines. Um, so I'll conclude so that there's some time for discussion about this. Um, but um, as I said, I guess the, the main results here is that is that we, we even though the electron transfer reaction is really, really fast, okay, and on a pretty simple reaction coordinate initially, we do not see any evidence of electronic coherence in the reaction and goes back, as I said, to the Jordan and Bixen work in the past. Um, secondly, the electron transfer reaction, and this is the main result here, is it allows us to see that there's a sequence of relaxation processes. It's not just everything on top of everything else leading to um, relaxation and dephasing, that there's actually a, a distinct sequence that we can pick up that um, are ordered according to the period of the vibrational degrees of freedom with then the stochastic um, motion of the solvent, the polarization of the environment being the slowest in this case. Um, and as I said, there's this structure in the wave packet, which is telling us even more detail about these relaxations. Um, it seem, we seem to be able to pick it up because of anhomogeneity in that mode, but exactly what it's telling us about um, the relaxation, um, which, um, which, is not, which, which cannot simply be um, incoherent relaxation, by the way, to see that structure. I think that's an interesting open question. Um, and 
I'll finish with acknowledgement of the of the group right now at Princeton, and this was all funded by the US Department of Energy. So thanks very much again for inviting me.